everyone, thank you for joining me through the Blackthorn Arch, a podcast all about folk tales, fairy stories, and ghostly encounters in the UK. My name is Hearth, spelt H-E-A-R-T-H, and today we're going to be doing another Witchcraft Let's Chat episode. Recently, I've had a few topics on my mind that I wanted to talk about somewhere, and I decided the podcast was probably the best place to put this. Don't worry though, I am currently filming, scripting, and editing season two. It's just taking me a while to do all of the research for each of the stories, but at some point in the near future there will be season two with even more spooky and interesting stories from the British Isles. For this episode, I have a few tiny topics that I wanted to touch on, those that all surround the changing of the seasons and things within our magical practice changing and shifting. As I'm recording this episode, it's the first week of September and it's currently a thunderstorm outside, so if you do hear any rain or thunder, that would be why. This time of year, we're starting to see the real shifts from summer to autumn. I've noticed that in England, a heat wave is broken and we've now had several days of thunder and lightning, as well as some torrential downpours. And I know that my friends around the world have also noticed similar changes in their own environments, as we're starting to see the very visceral change from summer to autumn. During this time of year, lots of change is happening. Not only is the season changing, the weather is changing, children are going back to school, teenagers are going off to university, and we're often seeing changes within the animal kingdoms as well. This is a time of year where many magical practitioners will shift their style of practice. Gone are the long days of spring and summer. We're starting to get darker nights, longer nights, colder nights. And so magical practice is often brought inside, especially if it is going to be affected by adverse weather conditions. There's nothing quite like trying to do a fire ceremony in torrential rain. It doesn't always go as planned, so you may find that your workings need to be brought inside. You might shift from working in your back garden to working in your living room, and especially as children are going back to school again, you might find if you are a parent and a magical practitioner that you're going to be able to have a little bit of spare time inside when you're able to do your magical practice. This is also the time of year where kitchen witches are at their busiest. The harvest is coming in and we're starting to see more and more practitioners showing off their cooking and culinary skills within their magical practice. The festivals at this time of year often surround baking, cooking and feasting, and with the preservation of food that we've harvested in the summer, it's a really busy period for kitchen witches to bring stuff into their home that they've grown outside. There are, however, going to be a few potentially unwanted guests within your space. This is a time of year where spiders start coming inside by their thousands. I myself have noticed this. I live in a relatively old house, around the 1800s, and currently it is home to about 200 spiders, and those are just the ones that I can see. They always say that however many spiders you can see, there's probably 10 more that you can't, and that's definitely the case in my house at the moment. If you're not a fan of spiders, you can safely relocate or rehome them, but I would recommend just keeping them around because they're generally very good housekeepers and will help you out in many different ways. This is, however, the time of year where we're going to start seeing more and more people posting on social media about how they're seeing spiders and whether or not that could be a sign of a deity or a spirit trying to communicate with them. I will say here that although it may well be a sign, it's probably more likely to simply be the time of year. This really is the spider season. They are everywhere right now. And as the weather starts getting more adverse outside, I'm not sure if you can hear the crashing of thunder and lightning, you're gonna start finding more and more insects and other wildlife are going to want to make a home within your house. And because of this, you're probably gonna start seeing them more often. That doesn't necessarily mean that the spiders you're seeing are a sign of anything in particular, other than the changing of the seasons. Though, of course, if you are looking out for signs from spirits and deities, make sure that you're looking for them in other ways as well. You're going to be seeing a lot of spiders in the physical form at this given time. But if you start seeing them in your dreams, in your meditations, in your readings, if you're doing any kind of trance work and you're also seeing spiders, this is then something that you should think about. But if you're just seeing them in your home, it's probably just the time of year. 
Now this is not only the time of year for spiders, but it's also the time of year where many young people and others are going off to university, college, wherever it is that you go away for school. Now this is a time that can be incredibly stressful for lots of people. So parents, guardians, friends, family, it could be a really good time to start creating items, objects, charms, protections that your friends, family and loved ones can take with them, especially if they're going to be studying and they're going to be living alone, perhaps somewhere they've never been before. It could be a really good time to start looking into poppets and long distance spell work and ritual so that if the individual would like you to, you can do a working on their behalf if they aren't going to be physically around you. It's a good time to create good luck charms, protection charms, and also study and education based charms, particularly those surrounding knowledge, memory and focus. These are all really good to take with you, and because university and college accommodation usually doesn't allow burning of anything, it can be a really good alternative for them to use if they aren't able to use candles and incense and the like. This is something that a lot of magical practitioners do struggle with. I know that I certainly did at my time at university. University accommodation is usually very strict, as is rented accommodation. Usually you cannot have pets, you cannot burn incense, you cannot use candles. There are so many rules and restrictions that are going to limit the kind of things that you can do. So it's really useful to be checking on your accommodation rules to see what you can and cannot bring, what you can and cannot do. I found at my time that I wasn't allowed to burn candles or incense, but we were allowed electric wax warmers, which was something that you can use as a substitute for fragrance in spell work and ritual, if fragrance is something that's really important to you. I often find that within my own practice, I use a lot of incense, and when I was at uni, my practice really diminished because I wasn't able to use it. So using these fire-free alternatives like wax melts, pot potpourri, things like that that you can have around that are going to offer you fragrance without the heat could be a good alternative. Now is a really good time to be looking into candle alternatives. Now what you choose to use as an alternative is going to depend on how and why you're using candles. If you're using candles for atmospheric gain, so something that sets the mood for a particular working, you can look into LED candles. These could be the ones that flicker or simply the static ones. You can also get candles that are LED that change colours so that you can set a colour for your specific intent that could be really useful. If you're using candles as a representation of the fire element, then I would suggest trying to find things that represent the element without fire being included. These could be crystals, plants, colours, items, objects. Some people will simply use a candle holder to represent the fire element. I myself have always used fire salt. This is something I'm hoping to do a video on in the future. I know I've said that for many, many years, but I am actually planning on doing a video on this on my YouTube channel for any of you who do want to find out how I create this for myself. Now fire salt is just one of the many items that you can use. They typically include items that are fiery in nature such as hot peppers, cayenne peppers, chili, chili powder, these things that are really hot, spicy and can imbue aspects of the fire element into your workings. These are also great to use if you do do any elemental style workings and you do cast a circle and call in the quarters, you might want to use another item than a candle when it comes to representing the fire element in that style of working. If you're using candles as vessels that you later release the energy from, I would recommend trying to find a different item that you can use as a vessel, or you can use a different technique. Now, one of the main things that I enjoy doing at university was attending an Earth Religion Society. Now, these can be found at many different universities, though whether yours will have one is going to entirely depend on where you live. These are essentially pagan and witchcraft organisations that are created by students for students. At my university, University, it was free to attend, but at others you might find that there is a small weekly fee for attending them. At these weekly meetings, you will gather with other pagans and witches, you may well undertake spell work and ritual with them, and they may also be able to get special circumstances where you are able to undertake spell work and ritual and include fire in those workings for religious purposes. In my particular group, we were able to go to a local stone circle where we were able to do sabbat and esbat rituals with a bonfire 
fire. This was all carefully controlled, of course. We had fire extinguishers and everything available so that we could put the fire out as we needed to, but it did mean that if I needed to do any kind of spell work and ritual that used the fire element, I was able to use the fire pit and the bonfire environment at these weekly meetings so that I could get my workings done. It was also a great time to be able to meet and mingle with other magical practitioners, share information and gain information from them, and I have met some amazing people whilst I was at university, some of whom I still admire and look up to within their magical practices today. So that's definitely something that you can look into doing. While you're away though, you may find that your magical practice isn't consistent, and I just want to remind you that that's perfectly okay. When you're at university or away at college, you're going to be exceptionally busy. For some people, you might spend a huge amount of your time doing work, essays, assignments, revising for exams. You might not have time to invest in your magical practice. And I just want to repeat, as I repeat so often on my YouTube channel, that you are still a valid magical practitioner if you have to step back and take a break. While I was at university, there was at least a year that I didn't practice at all for myself for that entire time period. I didn't even do any divination because I was simply so busy doing my dissertation and revising for all of my exams in order to get the degree that I didn't have time to do anything else. And so for a solid year, I didn't go to the Earth Religion Society, I didn't do any magical practice, and I didn't do any divination readings. I came out of that grateful for the year that I'd spent away from my magical practice because it gave me more time to be able to focus on my studies and when I came back to it, I was looking at it from a fresh perspective. This really is a time of change. And for some of you, you might find that your magical practice is going to dramatically shift. The deities, the spirits, the magical beings that you're working with, even your style of practice might completely turn itself on its head, especially if you're fairly new to magical practice. If this is your first year in this magical system, you might find that things will dramatically change. And I don't want you to be scared of that change. I know that change is really freaky. We don't really like it all that much. But within my experience, change within magical practice happens for a reason. So if you're feeling a little bit stagnant at the moment, you might find that change is just on the horizon and ultimately your magical practice might be better for it. So those are really the things I wanted to focus on as tiny topics in today's episode. I really hope that you did enjoy this episode. If you do have any tiny topics that you would like me to touch on in the future, that's even more teas. Wow, I just keep going with the teas today. Please let me know. You can either contact me directly via email, you can send me a message on YouTube or on Instagram. All of the details are on the podcast homepage and also on my YouTube channel. If you did enjoy this episode, feel free to let me know, share it, like it on YouTube. If you are listening on YouTube, these podcast episodes are available in audio form so that you can listen to them on the go. If you are listening to this on a podcast platform, there is also a video form of this episode if you would like to check that out. With that all being said, I hope you have a marvellous magical day, and I hope that I can get you through the Blackthorn Arch in the future for another magical episode. Bye! Now for some people, Whoa! That was a crash of lightning! <laughs> okay, if you are listening to this, I'm hoping that you heard that. If you are watching this on YouTube, you will probably have seen my reaction to that giant flash of lightning. Oh my goodness.